If you could this morning, turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And if you don't have a Bible, you can grab a pew Bible that's underneath the pew or in front of you. Um, and you can turn to Hebrews 11. And that'd be on page, I think, 1007. I had the task of uh, preaching 40 verses. And if you keep track of time, I don't even have 40 minutes. Um, so I'll be jumping around, needless to say, in this, in this passage. So if you could follow along in your Bibles, I think it'd help you very much to get what I'm saying. Pray with me again as we ask God to help us receive his word. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we pray that you would give us the gift of illumination by your spirit, that he would help shine light into our hearts so that we might see your word afresh, and we might understand it properly, Lord, and that we might put it into practice. Lord, that we would, just not, we would not just hear with physical ears, but with ears of faith, with spiritual ears, Lord. We would not just... Um, Receive your word as true, but as precious, Lord, as real, as satisfying, Lord, that we might walk away from the preaching of this word, change people, reflecting Christ more and more to this world, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're continuing the sermon series in Hebrews, um, and if you've been following along, you know that so far uh, in, in Hebrews that we've heard preaching on the superiority of Christ. How Christ is greater than angels. How Christ is the greatest prophet, even greater than Moses, who is held in high esteem by you know, the Jews. That he's the greatest priest who ever lived, greater than Aaron and greater than this obscure guy named Melchizedek. And not only is he the greatest priest, but he's the greatest sacrifice that's ever been offered. Not only does he come and fulfill the role of a priest and offer a sacrifice, but he is himself that perfect sacrifice that is offered that wipes away sins once and for all. And he's the author of a better covenant, the new covenant, the one that lasts forever, that fulfills all the other covenants that had come before, and that forgives sins and purchases us for, for us a, a righteousness that we couldn't get from the other covenants. And so as this theology is being laid out of the beauty and the, the bigness and the perfections of Jesus, uh, we came last week to Hebrews 10, 32 through 39. And we learn that what is so um, crucial about understanding the superiority of Christ is that the audience, this, this church these, that's compiled of mainly Jewish believers, you know, they used to be Jewish and they've come to believe in Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, that they're facing persecution for identifying with Jesus. That it literally says in here that they have their property taken from them and that they're losing their possessions, that their, their livelihood, their um, you know, their shelter is gone as a consequence of identifying with Jesus. And the, um, the temptation for some of them is to revert back to the old way, to identify again with Judaism so that they can avoid all the persecution. So they're facing the prospect of if they compromise, they'll, they'll be alleviated of all this uh, persecution and suffering. But if they don't compromise, if they continue to hold fast to Christ, as this author is pleading with them, that there is the prospect of not, not just persecution, not just imprisonment, but physical death, martyrdom. And so this is very real. This, this theology that he's preaching isn't a nice systematic theology class for you know, some you know, nerdy Bible college students. This is a church that is facing a, the serious and real prospect of temptation. And what he does to connect all that theology of the bigness and the beauty of Jesus to this prospect of temptation and suffering is he tells them the way to continue to persevere and cling to Jesus in the face of all that is to live by faith. And that's why we have Hebrews chapter 11. It's a chapter of living by faith. It's famously called the Hall of Faith, where the author of Hebrews walks us through Old Testament saint after Old Testament saint to show this audience that even these Old Testament saints had to live by faith just as much as we do because they were given promises and we're told things that had never quite came to pass in their life. And we as Christians, we're awaiting something future and greater that God has promised for us. That we don't experience in this life the fullness of all that God has in store for us, of all that Christ has purchased for us. That this life is foretaste of the fullness that is to come in eternity when we get to be with Christ. 
And so as Christians, even today, that our calling in the prospect of the obstacles and the temptations and the trials and even the, the pleasures that this life holds out to us, the calling is to live by faith. That we as Christians, we're not only saved by faith, by a belief in Jesus, but also as Christians, we are sustained by living by faith. By not only looking at back at what Christ has done, by looking forward to what Christ will do, what he's promised to do, and what he, what he has purchased for us in his life, death, and resurrection. So the Christian race, the pilgrimage that we walk on as we look towards the heavenly city, is taken as we take steps by faith. So I want to walk us through Hebrews 11, and obviously I'm not going to be able to cover 40 verses. That would be a miracle. But I do believe in miracles, so maybe it'll happen. <laughs> But I want to give us the essence, the kind of the, the framework for Hebrews 11 so that you can take its, its, its rich meaning, its main point, and then dive back into it and look at all the details. And I want to start by asking the question, what is faith? How does the author of Hebrews define faith for us? And I'm going to give you my own word definition of what he says, and then I'll unpack the verses where I'm getting them from. So what is faith? Faith is a solid hope and sure conviction in the reality and rewards of God. Let me say that again. Faith is a solid hope and a sure conviction in the reality and rewards of God. So let me just break that apart and point you to the text in the passage. So first, faith is a solid hope, a solid hope. And look with me at the first verse of chapter 11. Where the author says this, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And I take this to mean that the type of faith that will sustain us through all the obstacles and trials that, we'll, that we face in this life is a faith made up of solid hope. Not just hope. I mean, everybody loves hope. I mean, even this world markets hope. I mean, hope is a very hallmark term. You know, those greeting cards, those get well cards. I mean, they love to put hope on there. But this world's hope is so flimsy and baseless because what they're offering to us is basically a hope and hope. And hope and hope is just as good as fairy tales and pixie dust. And as any seven-year-old knows, those aren't real. They don't work. I've tried to fly with it before. It doesn't work. If we want a solid hope, which I hope we all do, we need a solid object for our hope. The key is not just hope, it's solid hope, and it's solid hope in something. But before I get to that something, let's look at the second part of what faith is. That faith is not only a solid hope, but it's a sure conviction. It's a sure conviction. Look at the second half of verse 1. It says, faith is the conviction of things not seen. The conviction of things not seen. So faith not only hopes and expects and longs for and looks forward to something. But faith has a dominating belief or an an empowering trust that it has what I like, what I'm calling here in the definition, a sure conviction in its object. And that faith is often referenced to what we'd say, you know, unjustifiable optimism or a magical feeling that if you just conjure up this thing called faith, that it will, you know, magically make everything disappear that's harmful or dangerous. But that is not how faith is defined for us in Hebrews. Rather, faith is a sure conviction in something, and not just any old something, but rather in someone who has proven himself worthy of such a sure conviction. Now, what is the object of our faith? What is this great object that we should have a solid hope and a sure conviction in? And what I believe the author of Hebrews says is that the object of our faith is the reality and the rewards of God. The reality and the rewards of God. And I'm getting this from verse 6. Look with me at verse 6. It says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe, and then he lists two things for us, must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who come to him, that he rewards those who seek him. So first, faith is in the reality of God. But don't take the reality of God to mean just a mere intellectual knowledge that there's a higher power out there named God. That's not what 
true faith in God is. Faith in the reality of God means that you not only believe that God exists, but that he is the supreme being of all existence. That what separates demons' faith, that James 2 says, you know, even demons believe in God. And what separates real, biblical, sustaining, saving faith is belief not only that God exists, but that he is the supreme being of all existence. Faith happily, true faith happily embraces God's declaration of himself that I am who I am, as he reveals to Moses in Exodus 3.14. That faith gladly embraces God when he says, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, as Isaiah 42.8 says. And that faith gladly comprehends That Genesis 1-1 starts with, in the beginning was God. That it's only God who is in the beginning. And that beginning is only a silly word used for humans like us who have a beginning, but not God. That God is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. That he inhabits eternity past and eternity future. And faith hears things like, thus says the Lord, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. And faith gives a hearty amen to that. But the second object of faith mentioned in verse 6 doesn't seem as fitting as the first. And the the second object of faith that Hebrews 6 or 11.6 points out to us is believing in the rewards of God. Believing in God as rewarder. And what makes this aspect of our object of faith at least initially seem odd is our understanding of the, the word reward then when we typically hear the word reward, we think of it in terms of like payment for good behavior. Like when, if you're training a dog and you want the dog to to be potty trained, you want him to go outside, not inside. So when he goes outside, he gets a reward for good behavior, right? Or we think of reward in terms of the points we receive or the the credit we receive for paying our credit card bills on time or the miles, you, you name it. But the author of Hebrews does not have in mind reward for good behavior or timeliness. Rather, The author of Hebrews, when he's using reward to speak of of what God does to those who seek him, is he's telling a group of struggling saints who are walking through persecution, the death of friends, the imprisonment of friends, and the loss of all their possessions, that when you come to God for grace and sustenance and more faith, he supplies more than you can ask or imagine. That this is a type of rewarding God we serve. Not the God who pats you on the back for good behavior, but the God who pours out his preserving grace to weary travelers as we walk towards the heavenly city. That true faith that looks to God as rewarder comes to him in emptiness because it knows that God rewards out of his fullness. That true faith comes to God in weakness because it knows that he rewards out of his strength. And that true faith comes to God in neediness because it knows that God rewards out of his generosity. So the meaning of faith that we're working with in Hebrews 11, faith is a solid hope, that it has a foundation, a base, something to uphold it. And it's a sure conviction, not just a whimsical, magical thought, but a sure conviction in the reality of God, that he is real and he is rewarder. So that's faith. And the next thing I want to do as we get an overview of Hebrews 11 is move from looking at what faith is to looking at what faith does. So not only what's the meaning of faith, but what are the marks of faith? How does faith evidence itself? How does faith actually work itself out as we walk the Christian life? And that's basically what the the heart of this passage is, is he's giving them, Old Testament saint, examples of what it means to live by faith, what it looks like. And for sake of time, I'm just going to highlight three for us. And you can look at the other ones on your own. I want to look at Noah, Abraham and Moses, that these are kind of the, the, the pinnacle of Old Testament saints that, that Jews look to. So first, let's look at the marks of faith as displayed in the life of Noah. So turn with me to Hebrews 11.7, 11, 7, where we learn about Noah. 11.7 says, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So unfortunately for us, I feel like the, the story of Noah 
has become so first grade Sunday school. And now it's become very Hollywood as there's, I think, a, a third movie being made about the, the flood and the, the life of Noah. But what the author of Hebrews is, is doing here is he's demonstrating that faith does outlandish things, like build a massive ark when there's not even a cumulonimbus cloud in the sky. I think cumulonimbus. I think those are the, the rain ones. Whatever. There's not a rain cloud in the sky. And yet Noah takes God by his word and builds an ark. And so what he's showing is that faith in the case of Noah willingly submits to the call of God. That faith hears the summons of God as he speaks to us in his word and submits out of a reverence for God, regardless of the circumstances and what we can see going on around us. And just like in Noah's day and in Noah's case, faith in our day also requires a willingness to submit to God's call. I mean, think of this. It takes faith in God as supreme reality to submit your career aspirations and your desire for a higher standard of living in order to take the time to invest in raising godly children. For some, that means sacrificing your career to pour into kids. It takes a solid hope in God to submit your free time, or as I like to call it, me time, um, so that you can spend it serving others inside and outside the church. I mean, it takes a belief in God as rewarder to submit your desires for the sinful indulgences that culture holds out to us every day, to actually submit them to God and then pursue Christ's likeness. That faith requires a willingness to submit, that it evidences itself in a willingness to submit. So that's Noah. Let's move on now to Abraham, the example of Abraham. Turn with me to uh, verses 17 and 18 of this chapter. Verses 17 and 18. says here, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. The author of Hebrews is drawing an example of faith from the life of Abraham that is uh, laid out for us in Genesis 21 and 22. And as you may recall, in Genesis 21, Sarah finally gives birth to the child that God has promised her, even though she's old and barren. And that this child is the one who's going to start to fulfill the promises that God gave Abraham in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 that were summed up as, your offspring will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands of the sea. And in Genesis 21, 12, as the author of Hebrews quotes, God even says that Isaac is the specific son through whom these promises will come, that there's not going to be another son, that this is the promised son. So all the promises of Genesis 12 and 15 and 17 hang on this son, Isaac. But yet, as we come to Genesis 22, the story takes a dramatic turn as God calls Abraham to offer up his son, his one and only son, as a burnt sacrifice. And it's this same son, Isaac, upon whom hangs all the fulfillment of God's promises. And yet Abraham demonstrates in Genesis 22 an unflinching faith in God, and he is willing to sacrifice his son in all that God has swore to him. And because Abraham passed the test that God was giving him by demonstrating a willingness to sacrifice, which is a mark of faith, God honors him and provides a ram instead for the sacrifice and keeps his promise to bless Abraham through Isaac. And our faith, like Abraham's, should also be marked by a willingness to sacrifice. But when we hear the word sacrifice, what's often overlooked is that the sacrifices that are usually required of us are very small, very ordinary, very everyday exertions of faith. For example, daily mundane life may require us to live by sacrificial faith and do the dishes, gentlemen, or drive the speed limit and be late, gentlemen, or let your children watch Sesame Street instead of Monday night football. That's, a, that's, that's maybe a bigger sacrifice, but a sacrifice nonetheless. And faith may require little children here to sacrifice playtime to help mommy and daddy, but it's still a sacrifice that takes faith. However, we must remember, though, that it's the trillion of ordinary acts of sacrificial faith that actually help us prepare for the very big tests of faith. That we can't separate everyday life from the big things that happen in life. 
Like there may be a big test that comes that you may be called to care for the diminishing health of a parent or a spouse. Or you might be called to go overseas and spread the gospel. Or whatever, it, might be, it may come in the form of a sickness. Whatever God calls you to in these circumstances, we must remember, ordinary or extraordinary, faith as demonstrated by Abraham has a solid hope and a sure conviction and is marked by a willingness to sacrifice. So Noah, a willingness to submit. Abraham, a willingness to sacrifice. And now finally, let's look at Moses. And turn to verses 24 and 25 of chapter 11. We'll look at another mark of faith as displayed in the life of Moses. Verse 24, it says, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. So Moses here, though he was an Israelite by birth, he was actually raised in, in Pharaoh's courts. He was raised as an Egyptian. So he got to experience all the benefits of being a rich and free man. Well, he got to watch on as his fellow Israelite experienced the life of a slave and a poor man. Yet, when God called Moses to oppose Pharaoh and Egypt and to deliver the Israelites, he chose to forego all the painless pleasure of being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and was willing to suffer with his people, the Israelites. And we have to know that Moses knew the consequences of what it would mean to oppose Pharaoh to his face and ask all the slaves, which is, I mean, that's their economy right there, that they re- relied on the Israelites to build everything. And he was asking them to to let them go, that he knew the consequences, that it was going to come with suffering. And yet, his solid hope in the God who sent him produced a faith in him that was willing to suffer with his people. And no doubt, as 21st century American Christians, when we hear the Bible speak of suffering, it, it seems very foreign to us. And to some degree, it should seem foreign to us, because we have the privilege of living in a country where we have the freedom to worship. But as we keep following the news, we, we know that our religious freedom is, is slowly eroding away. And the question we may be faced with in the coming years and decades, or our grandchildren may be faced with, is do we have a faith that is willing to suffer possibly social ostracism, political persecution, and maybe even criminal charges for believing and practicing what the Bible clearly says? Is our faith the kind of faith that would look at the comfort that could come from compromise as the Hebrew audience, the audience of Hebrews is faced with. Could we look at the comfort that could come from compromise and say, no, I refuse to compromise. I must have Christ. I must identify myself with Christ, no matter the cost. And I pray that God would give us such faith as demonstrated by Moses. So I hope that as you've, you've heard me walk through the meaning of faith first and now the marks of faith, as displayed in Noah and Abraham and Moses, that you're, you're wondering the question and you want me to answer, how do we gain such faith? How do we gain such faith? Where does a faith that is willing to submit and sacrifice and suffer, where does it come from? And I hope you're not thinking, oh, that's, that's all it is? That's easy. I mean, I, I, can, I can conjure up a, a solid hope and a sure conviction anytime. I mean, I can, I can sacrifice on the drop of a hat. That would be uh, not faith but self-dependence. And self-reliance. And we don't want self-reliance and self-dependence. We want God-dependence and God-reliance. And that's what faith is. And we need to feel that type of faith. We need to look away from ourselves. We need to look outside of ourselves and look outward and upward at God. And so where I want to take us in the last part of this sermon is into the rest of Hebrews 11 and answer the question, what is the motivation for faith? What truly fuels a God-dependent faith? How can we build a solid hope and a sure conviction? And this is where the sermon gets really practical because what the author of Hebrews is doing is not holding up Old Testament saints as trophies on a pedestal that we should bow down and worship because they're so much better than us. But he's giving examples of real human people, real frail and fallen human people. I mean, we can't forget that Abraham is the one who lied about the identity of his wife and said it was his sister multiple times. That he's the one who, in order to try and fulfill God's promise, got Hagar, his maidservant, pregnant. 
Because you thought, okay, if my wife can't give birth and God promised me a son, I'll get someone else pregnant. And that we shouldn't forget that Moses is the one not only who murdered an Egyptian in order to protect his people, but he's the one who, when God called him to go, said, no, 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 you got the, you got the wrong guy. Don't send me. I can't, I can't talk. I can't speak. I can't oppose him. And that even Noah, Noah's the one who saw God deliver him through a flood on an ark that he built where God supplied all the supplies he needed to build the ark. And then after he gets off the boat that God had delivered him from this flood, he gets drunk and his sons actually see his nakedness uncovered. And there's another fall in a sense as this, this first family again shows itself sinful. So we have to remember that these are ordinary everyday people just like us as well, that these are not, these are Old Testament saints, yes, but they're saints just like us and that they look to the Savior. They look to something else to live by faith. So what fueled their faith and what should fuel our faith? First thing that fuels our faith is looking to the past and recounting what God has done. Looking to the past and recounting what God has done. Look at verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 11 with me. It says, By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Since she considered him faithful who had promised. So it was Sarah's understanding of the faithfulness of God that sustained her faith in God's promise to give her a child, even though she was old and barren. And we, what we must remember, just like Sarah did, is that God has a perfect history of doing what he said he would do, recorded for us in Scripture. That despite all the opposition that God has faced from enemies, and even the opposition he's faced from the own people he's trying to use, that God has always delivered according to what he has said. This is why we should constantly recount to ourselves the works of God, as the psalmist in Psalm 19 calls us to. It says in Psalm 9-1, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. And what Psalm 9-1 is saying is that we can give thanks with our whole heart when we remember and recount all the wonderful deeds of God that display his faithfulness. And I'm afraid that we suffer from spiritual amnesia, spiritual amnesia, which causes us to forget what God has done, not only in the history of redemption, but in our lives personally. This causes us, when we have spiritual amnesia, to have a very small, fragmented view of God's faithfulness. And it's hard to have a strong faith in something when you don't believe that that something is very faithful. And the spiritual amnesia that we suffer from is exactly why we celebrate things like the Advent season. This is why we have a Christian calendar that um, has things in there that remind us not only that Christ came as a baby, but like Good Friday, that he died on a cross in our place, and like Easter Sunday, that he rose victoriously over sin, Satan, and death. Because we suffer from spiritual amnesia, we need this recounted for us, not only in the church calendar, but every Sunday when we come to hear the word preached. That's the food to help us overcome our spiritual amnesia. And so as we think about this Advent season and remember the wonderful work of God in sending his son to become a, a baby in a manger, that we would recount for us the wonderful deeds of God, that we have the privilege of living on this side of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And we have that much more reason to think God faithful than Sarah did <coughs> and thus fuel our faith. So by way of application, I would say, take time this Advent season and even throughout the church calendar, Good Friday, Easter, those things, to remind yourself and prepare yourself um, and think about what God has done for you to show that he is faithful. And if you have kids, help your kids. And if you have grandkids, help your grandkids. If you have neighbors, help your neighbors to recount God's wonderful deeds. Second thing that fuels our faith is comprehending God's power. Comprehending God's power. We need to understand God's omnipotent ability to do far beyond what we could ask or imagine. Turn back to verse 3 of Hebrews 11, verse 3 of Hebrews 11. And it says in the first part of verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. The universe was created by the word of God. 
And you might see that and wonder, what does this have to do with strengthening our faith? How does understanding that the universe was created by the word of God strengthen our faith? And let me recount for you uh, Psalm 121, the first two verses there, and I think this will help us answer that question. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So the psalmist, looking to the hills, he's got a dangerous journey ahead of him, and he needs help. He needs someone to care for him, to preserve him, to sustain him on his journey. And the only one who can help him is someone big enough and strong enough to sustain him in that journey. And the person he looks to is the Lord. And the evidence that the Lord is strong enough to help him in his time of need is that the Lord can create the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth display God's power. I mean, if God can simply speak into existence galaxies and daffodils and armadillos, then certainly he's strong enough to sustain our faith. And for you gentlemen, daffodils, those are, those are flowers. It's a type of flower. <laughs> I, I had to look it up on the internet too. So, <laughs> so if God can speak those things, into, if, if what we see in the created world was spoken by God's word, then we ought to know that he is strong enough to sustain our faith. And look at Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 to 19. Turn back to Hebrews uh, verse 17 to 19. And we learn about what fueled Abraham's faith so that he was willing to sacrifice his promised son, Isaac. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested and offered up his son, the one who had received the promises was in the act of offering him up through Isaac, shall your offspring your name. And then verse 19, verse 19 is the key, that Abraham considered that God was able even to raise Isaac from the dead. That when Moses walked up that mountain to sacrifice his son, he wasn't some crazed lunatic who believed he got a word from the Lord, but he knew, he knew that God, who had promised that this son would be the one to fulfill the promises, would make it come to pass even if it meant raising his son from the dead because God had that type of power. And it's this understanding of the power of God to even defeat death that sustained Abraham's faith as he walked up that mountain. As Christians, we not only have to consider that God can raise the dead, But we can just look at the work of God through the life of Jesus in raising him from the dead to defeat death and sin and Satan. And by way of application, I would say to understand God's power, we ought to take time throughout our lives, our everyday lives even, to stare up into the sky or even look at snowflakes if they come while you're shoveling them and be blown away by the power of God's word that put it all there. And likewise, we also ought to continually reflect upon the power of God displayed in the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, especially his resurrection, his resurrection power, which overcomes these massive enemies of sin and Satan and death, and that this should be our motivation, our fuel for our faith. And I'm going to skip, if you're following along on the, on the handout notes, I'm going to skip the third one because I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time and I'm going to combine it with the last one. So we'll jump to the fourth one on the notes, perspective. So another thing that fuels our faith as we walk through this life is having a proper perspective on our place in this world. I mean, having a proper perspective makes a massive difference, especially when you're going through trial and loss. I mean, just think about how devastating it would be to have an improper perspective when you go through a trial or loss. I mean, for example... If, if you were to lose a job and the salary that went with it and um, the insurance and the benefits and the retirement funds that went with it, and you have the perspective that life is all about living for the American dream, that life is all about gaining stuff, that he who has the most toys wins, if that's your perspective, and that you go through that loss and trial, then your world will be shattered. And I don't want to take away from the fact that losing a job, is, that, that's a true loss, but it becomes a earth-shattering loss when we believe that life is about the American dream. But if you have a biblical perspective in a situation like this, that we wait life after death, that there's something future and greater to come, that we will wait a life with Jesus in a new heavens and new earth, that we live for something more than the American dream, which is so unsatisfying and temporary, then you will have faith to sustain you through this type of trial and loss. 
And listen to the perspective that the saints of old had in Hebrews 11.13. Hebrews 11.13 says there, These all died in faith. All these Old Testament saints died in faith, not having received the things promised. Meaning, they didn't receive the fullness of all that God had promised. They just had foretastes. But having seen them and greeted them from afar, and here's the key, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, that they could live by faith. So having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So they knew that this earth wasn't their home, that they were awaiting something future and greater. And it allowed them to be sustained through times of not experiencing the fullness of what God had promised. That they they could still cling to the, the perspective that this was not their home. And it fueled their faith so they could sacrifice, so they could suffer the loss of earthly things because they knew that the best was yet to come. And this is what C.S. Lewis was getting at when he made this famous quote. He said, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. That the Christians who were most effective and fruitful in this life were the ones who thought most about the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. And what Lewis is saying there is, if we have eternity stamped on our hearts, and our eyes are fixated on that, then we will be faithful and fruitful in this life, because we won't be hoping that this life has all that it has to offer. That we'll be looking for something else for joy and satisfaction and hope. But when we think that this life is all there is, we have that perspective that we'll miss heaven and we'll get neither because earth will end up letting us down like it always does. And so I'd say a, a third way of application to help us feel our faith is to take time to study what scripture says, what, what great authors of the faith have said about heaven and the eternal state, a new heavens and a new earth. That, that beautiful picture in Revelation 21 and 22 of when God comes to dwell with us and we get to be with God in a place where there's no more sin and sorrow and suffering. I mean, read the Narnia series, especially the last book, The Last Battle, where Lewis describes when the children finally get to enter the real Narnia, the new Narnia, the better Narnia, the one that was so much greater than what they'd experienced in the other Narnia. And it was like they were just starting the first chapter of the rest of their lives and that every chapter after that was better than the chapter that had happened previously. So finally, the last element that fuels our faith is looking to the promised prize of God, the promised prize of God. So not only do we need a proper perspective on our life on this earth, but we should look towards something that's coming and hold on to it and remind ourselves of it and memorize it so that we can continue to feel our faith as we not only look away from something, but walk towards something better. And holding on to the precious promises of God is what fuels our faith so that we can walk by faith toward our eternal home and everlasting prize. That that Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, we should be people who walk by faith and not by sight. That we're not materialists, we're not naturalists. What we can touch, touch and taste and see, that's not all there is. That there's something else to come. That what we can touch and taste and see is actually passing away and is merely a foretaste of what's to come. And we ought to look to those promises that God holds out for us. I mean, this is what fueled Abraham in Hebrews 11, 9, and 10. It says, By faith Abraham went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So what caused Abraham to leave his homeland when God originally called him, to leave his family, everything he had ever known, all the comforts of home? He was looking forward to God giving him a city that God had built that would not be shaken, a, a, you know, indestructible, eternal city. And it's the promises of God that also fueled Moses and gave him the faith to be willing to suffer. I read he, Hebrews eleven twenty four and 25 earlier where Abraham was willing to suffer with his people. But what fueled his willingness to suffer? 
And in verse 26 of Hebrews 11, it says this, Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. So it's as if, it, as if Moses took a scale and he balanced the treasures of Egypt against the, the greater wealth of, being, of suffering and identifying with Christ. And that it didn't, the scale didn't even measure up. That it was the, the reproach of Christ, identifying with Christ, was so much better than all the treasures that Egypt could offer because he was looking to a reward. And what is this reward that he was looking to? What is this reward, this city, that we should think about, the promises we should hold on to? And what the saints show us is that we should fix our eyes on a promise of, like Revelation 21 says, that one day Christ, who is working now to make all things new, will one day come back and complete his work. And then will come to pass the promise that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain. For the former things, this earth, have passed away. And one day we'll get to experience the full glorious reality of the promise of Psalm 1611, which says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And it's promises like these that are woven throughout scripture that we should cling to and, and memorize and meditate on. Because one day, we'll no longer need faith. Faith is just something temporary that we need until finally we get to see God face to face. That we'll get to gaze upon the full, glorious reality of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the faith that we need now to fuel it is faith in the fact that one day we'll no longer need faith, but we'll get to look at Christ face to face. So by way of application, keep your eyes peeled as you read through the Bible for God's promises and try to commit them to memory so that you can use them as you walk through this life to fight for joy and fix your eyes on eternity. As Christians, we must be faith-fueled people in order to run the Christian race with all its obstacles and temptations and trials and even triumphs that sometimes in, in the moments of um, plenty, we can forget God. And we need faith just as much in that moment to look to God. And as Hebrews 11 has shown us, Faith is the solid hope and sure conviction in the reality and rewards of God. And that faith, like the saints of old, is marked by a willingness to submit to God's word, to sacrifice earthly things, and to suffer with God's people. And faith is fueled by looking to the past and recounting the faithfulness of God. It's fueled by comprehending the power of God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And faith is fueled by gaining a proper perspective on our earthly existence, that this is not it. The best is yet to come. And finally, and most importantly, faith is fueled by clinging on to the hope of God's promised prize that awaits us in eternity, a new heaven with our Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that this word would take root in our hearts, Lord, and that it would grow fruit. Lord, that this vision of faith, this meaning of faith, Lord, would become real in our lives, that we would fuel our faith daily, Lord, as we look to you, to your word, Lord, as we depend on you in prayer, Lord. May you cause it to be by your grace, because we know that apart from your grace, we can do nothing. So because of Jesus and for his glory, help us to have faith and walk to him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.